hello there. Hey, thanks. Uh, thanks for joining us. My name is Dave Seymour. Um, if you've ended up in a position to to watch and listen to this recording, then um, I hope you know who I am. But if you don't, uh, I've been real estate investing now well over a decade. Um, started my career very, very simply. A um, little bit of wholesale transactions, single family homes. I worked my way up to uh, buy, fix and flips. I've held portfolios. I've been a lender. Um, I've done huge deals. I've done small deals. And along the way, I've, uh, I've bandied together with some pretty powerful individuals. I was very blessed to have a hit TV show on a and &E Network called Flipping Boston, where they followed me and my ex-partner around with a camera uh, pointing where the sun don't shine, <laughs> which was an interesting experience. But because of that, um, you know, I got, to, I got to attract some really powerful investors and today I class them as friends as well. So look, I've been blessed um, to pin down the young man. I think you can see him on the screen. You should be able to. His name is John Dessauer. Johnny's in the Chicago market. There he is. Hey, John. Hi, good morning. Thanks for having me. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. evening. Depending we never know. You know. <laughs> we never know. <laughs> You're talking to my old man back in England, John. It's good evening, right? <laughs> but um, John's in the Chicago market. I've, I've known John probably, what, 10 years now, Johnny? We've yeah. Been, yeah, 10 years. Um, John actually... Um, was very well entrenched with the uh, with the um, the banking industry when the when the kind of like the market crashed and you were carrying portfolios of single families as well as six, twelve, even some bigger uh, deals that you did in Chicago when the market tanked. Uh, that's where we first met. One of my best little deals ever. But um, uh, let me let, let's do this, John. You introduce yourself to the to the folks that are listening to this, to the potential investors, and um, share a little bit about yourself, man. Otherwise, I'll take up all the oxygen in the room. You know me. <laughs> well, I'm also I'm also Dave's personal hairstylist. Thank so, you. Okay, that's not true. That's not true. No, you're not. So, uh, I've been heavily involved in in real estate investing uh, for the majority of my career, adult career, and um, you know I've bought multifamily units. It's been the main focus of my investing criteria. Uh, but I've, you know, fix and flip and we've worked with foreclosures and, and uh, a lot of different asset types uh, throughout my career. And one of the things that gets me most excited about uh, talking about real estate is because I've lived it. I've lived the benefits of it providing for my family and, and really taking uh, myself to the next level financially. So I've been able to do that over the last 20 years. I've got a, uh, a, you know, we have a brokerage that we deal with a lot of clients from all over the, not only in the country, but in the world where they're looking for assets to um, uh, buy themselves. So, you know, I've have a rich history in that. So it's probably, John, it's tell me a little bit, tell me a little bit about Anton and the management company, because that's, that's a huge value add for me as a fund manager. Um, tell me, just break it down a little bit. I, we'll, we'll get into it more on this call, but um, talk, talk about Anton. What, is, what does that look like? What kind of service does that give to individual investors as well as fund managers like myself? Yeah, so uh, what's interesting is I, I once heard a story about Andrew Carnegie or Carnegie, if you're in Carnegie. Uh, That's where you come you from, know. yeah. And uh, uh, I heard a story about how he was originally involved in the telegraph business. And uh, the telegraph business, if, if for those of you that know, or hopefully maybe some remember if they're that old, probably not. <laughs> probably uh, not. Know, they put telegraph lines along what? Railroads, right? And then, uh, so uh, the railroads uh, became part of Andrew, I'm gonna say Andrew like he's my best friend, right? Yeah. Part of Andrew's business and so we had to get involved in the railroad business, buy railroads, and one of their biggest purchases as a railroad company is steel for the rails. And so the, the rest became history, he became the wealthiest man in the world because of the steel business he got into, but that's not where he started out at. And so the brokerage of Anton, it, it kind of brought me, um, I, I arrived there along the same lines. I got involved in real estate investing and you know, management, asset management is such an important role in that, that it, it's kind of led me to create that business. So we have a full brokerage. Uh, we operate in four states. Uh, we've got a full asset management company that manages everything from 
retail to apartment units to single family uh, kind of thing. And, and that really, um, that really is interesting because of how important management is in creating that uh, return that all investors are looking for. So on the fund management side, we use all kinds of different, you know, cool terminologies, if you will, right? I think, I think a lot of the, the, uh, I think a lot of the, 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 it's the, it's the words. It's, it's, it's like the, the, the acronyms for everything, right? So I think a lot of it is designed to confuse and keep, you know, a lot of investors out of it. If you think about the financial industry and all the terminologies they use, but we use, we use our own special language as well in the real estate world. And what John just described is what we call vertical integration. Okay. The, am I right, John? <laughs> right. Yeah. Vertical. Yeah. In, can you go vertically in your business? So if you are in, at the, you know, the, the, the financial level as a fund manager, do you also have the ability to do competent acquisitions, right? It's okay moving money, but uh, do you know how to buy it properly? And then once you're buying, what is your business plan? Because if you don't have a business plan um, in, in this world and you're just buying because it looks like a good deal, then, you know, you're, you're out of business very quickly and so is your reputation and the investors that join you. So vertical integration, the ability to raise the capital, deploy the capital, execute, right? Execute on the game plan, which is where, you know, John comes in as, as, a, as a, um, a professional asset manager, fund uh, managing the assets. Um, that would also include uh, my other partner, Walter, Walter Novicki, um, had his own construction experience. So we, we primarily are in the, in the um, Gulf Coast region. So it's okay to buy it if it needs work, but do you have the skill sets to, to fix it up? potentially raise the rents, lease up uh, those apartments. So um, we, it's funny, man. We said before the call, we're going to stay on point and already we're, <laughs> already we're off. So let's, let's dial it back in. We got vertical integration. We got some good synergies between myself and John, valuable, valuable team player, as I hope I am to you, brother. But let's, let's, go, let's go all the way back. Hey, dude, why real estate? What's so cool about real estate? I don't want to be a landlord. Are you kidding me? I watched Jerry Springer when it was on TV. I don't want any of those kind of tenants. <laughs> Mom, take, it away. <laughs> take it away, brother. Um, Why real estate? You know, I think it's an in interesting thing. You know, there's people have so many choices as to what they can invest in. You can invest in companies. You can invest in uh, precious metals. You can invest in, you know, all these different things. But the real interesting thing that when I look at something is I look at the classic economic lesson of supply and demand. Yeah. And um, when I look at that, housing certainly falls into that mode. And, you know, in, in, uh, during today's time frame, uh, the demand for housing is probably greater than it's ever been before. And if you had to build a business off of a model that was gonna give you the best chance of success, a model that would be a perfect fit for that would be one in which the demand is outpacing the supply. So why real estate? I think it goes back to that economic model where not only is supply uh, dwindling, uh, but it's not keeping up with demand. And when that happens, your price per unit goes up. So rents go up, the price of the individual unit, whether it's an apartment unit or even a single family house goes up. And I see that trend continuing. That's why, you know, my, my number one reason of why real estate, but that's also why I'm so bullish moving forward from here. We, we know, because we can look up the data anywhere, can't we? We can go online today, get all kinds of data. We know that the human population on our planet is going up. It's not going down. So that's the, right, that's the demand side. And then the supply side has got the deficit on it. Um, so I love, I love that you know, like that macro view of it. It's like, you know, big picture. That's, that's really what it is. Um, you know, I've, I've, I came into real estate, John, because, you know, I, I, I had some financial challenges. We'll just leave it at that. I couldn't keep on right <laughs> trading, trading time for money old school, but um, I've heard a couple of different things and, and I'd like your input on it. And I know I'm teeing these up to you, but it, it really is important. Um, a guy said to me one time, you can either work for money or have money work for you, right? Um, and, he, and then he prefaced it, and I found this important. And what he said was, it doesn't matter what your earning income is. 
it doesn't matter whether as a lot of our investors are accredited investors is what we attract and what we what we we work with it doesn't matter whether you're that you know that surgeon um, that high paying individual or even attorneys right some high paid attorneys um, and I got a bill from one recently so I know some of them are very highly paid but anyway sidebar um, but you know it doesn't matter whether they're in at 500 an hour or whether it's you know a, a lower paying uh, position it's still trading time for money um, and he said this is the way he put it to me he said it's simply a choice you know do you want to you know, figure it all out yourself, or do you want to align yourself with people who have, like we just described, vertical uh, vertical integration? So, work with me on that one, John. Share a little a little insight on that. Working for money or money working for you? There's not again. There's no right or wrong. It's just you know somebody's DNA. What what what's your take on that, John? Because I know you've been a serial entrepreneur for for a very long time. Yeah, it's an interesting thing about um, putting money to work for you because it allows you in this particular example to buy something once and get paid over and over and over in many different ways. There's typically four ways that we get paid in real estate. That's probably the second reason why I think, you know, the question of why real estate, because you get paid in so many ways by it. Um, and when I look at the ability, you know, most people finance their retirement through equity, through sweat equity. They go to work for a company for, 40 years and uh you know if you if you contribute to whatever the retirement plan is typically 401k uh maybe you get a company match there um which, you know, you which is now a one it's now a 101k it's yeah not, it's, not true, true. it's gone down significantly but most people uh finance their retirement through that i have looked at a way here with real estate where you can finance your retirement through debt or be a part of a system uh, like the fund where you can participate in that. And what's interesting about that is when you finance your retirement through debt, um, you don't need, you, sh you cut the 40 year learning curve down significantly. Yeah. And um, you know, when I look in the mirror, I don't know if I have 40 years, you know, I yeah. know you don't have 40 years by looking at you. <laughs> no, you older than me. no, we don't, no, but, so uh, we're, we're on the downward curve, huh? Yeah, well, parallel, but, anyway. But I look curve. at that and it's not a get rich quick scheme. It's the power of leverage and it's the power of using other people's money. See, this is like a, a symbiotic relationship where all sides benefit. You know, the bank benefits, they get interest from the, the debt, the mm -hmm. owner uh, and uh, owners or the fund benefits because they get a return through good operations. Um, so that's why I'm another reason why I'm so bullish, but that's also, you know, doing something different. We're not going with the herd, uh, kind of thing. We're, we're doing something different to get different results. So if, if I've got access to capital, we'll say, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. Look, I've got a hundred grand. I can go buy a single family house in, in some of the Southern markets for 50, $60,000, right? I could put fifteen, twenty thousand dollars into it, um, and I could sell it for you know one twenty, one thirty. That's an option. Or I got a hundred thousand dollars, and I can invest as a active or a passive investor. I guess I could take I could take that hundred thousand dollars, John. I could put twenty five percent down on a four hundred thousand dollar, maybe you know three flat, four flat in Chai Town somewhere in one of your your neighborhoods that, that you do a little business, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I could do it that way, or I could take $100,000 and I could invest it with, with fund managers, with a, with a diversified portfolio. What do, you, what do you see as the pros and cons of, of those three, three choices? So basically, why multifamily, John? Why do I, why do I, want, to play, why do I want to play that guy? Yeah, really good question. And Thank it, you. It, it all has to do with the topic of the velocity of money. And so- Ooh. Ooh, we, Hold on a minute, time out. Say know, that again. Let's say I know, it's, it's, sec it's sexy, isn't it? Isn't velocity it? of money. How fast it moves. Yeah, and what I mean by that is, if you bought a house before, or anybody watching this, if you've bought a house before, you know that the value of that house goes up increment, incrementally uh, with the market. You know, when the right. market's hot and moving up and more people are buying houses and those sales comps 
are at higher price points, the value of that house goes up. We've also found that the value of that house goes down in a declining market when uh, supply is dominating demand. And so what's interesting about that is on the multifamily side, and when, when we talk about velocity of money, there's a whole nother system that the average person that's buying a house or maybe investing in single family houses doesn't even realize. And it has to do with this world called, word called capitalization. And so the value of a multifamily unit is based on uh, something called a capitalization rate. And what that means basically is that when you increase the income that's made, the net operating income of the property, not to get too technical on this, but when you increase the income that the property's generating, um, the value of the property grows not incrementally, but exponentially. And so that's the reason that you can shorten that 40 um, year time. Plus years. Yeah. And, and a lot of people don't realize that that's the that's one of the secrets, not all the secrets, but that's one of the secrets right. where you can make this thing happen financially just because you're playing in a different game. You're playing, you know, you're playing in, a, in an arena where the velocity of money is so much faster. It, it's the difference of, you know, going from point A to point B and driving, you know, an 18 wheeler there or driving um, a, a Maserati. A Maserati there. It's that they're both vehicles, but right. one vehicle is going to get you there a lot faster. Yeah, yeah. Cap capitalization rates. It really, um, it really is a secret sauce to to the commercial world of multifamily, isn't it? I mean, yeah. to simplify it and add to it a little bit, a friend of mine said to me, "You will live and die by the NOI, the net operating income. What what will you do with this multifamily asset?" to increase its income value. And you can do that two ways. You increase by upping rents, uh, but you also, and here's where most people miss the mark, you can also increase value by decreasing expenses. And as a fund manager, we have uh, proprietary formulas that we identify and we look for in assets. And when we see our numbers come into, almost into the crosshairs, if you will, if to use a hunting analogy, when those numbers line up, uh, we know that it's time to pull the trigger. Dry powder will win the game. He who can pull the trigger and get something under contract with these these proprietary formulas, then you know I, I know and you know it's it's unlike Donkey Kong to, to to bring it to bring it into a different realm altogether. You know. Um, can so, I add one thing to that? Yeah, of course. So you you hit the nail on the head, increasing the income and decreasing expenses are a way to increase your NOI for sure. There's another way though. And that's why I think, you know, uh, business is, is one of the components of success is timing. We yeah. think about the timing right now of everything's going on. You know, people always need a place to live, but they don't always need a place to work. Matter of fact, they work from home. And I think that trend is going to continue uh, kind of thing. I think that's actually going to make commercial residential, i.e. multifamily units, um, more valuable in the long run because the demand is going to be that much more increased for housing because that's where they're also working. And so you're going to, what we're going to see is uh, in that particular asset class, maybe not in other asset classes like retail, office, things like that, but in multifamily, you're going to see a continued cap rate that's strong a compressing cap rate and you know we don't have to go th fully into that but that's another reason you know timing is so important for this uh you know this stage and in, in what we're involved in uh it's why it makes sense for multifamily right now yeah without doing a deep dive i'll just give you a little a little door opener um had a meeting with some some of our um our team recently and we started identifying assets, not only that look good from the residential standpoint, you know, good square footage, good quality home, good service, good community, like a really nice asset. But we also started looking at what about taking some of these clubhouses that these B-class assets have, and how about we put a CapEx raise in our, in our fund, in our acquisition, so that we take some of these clubhouses 
and we now transfer and, and make them out to be uh, like WeWork type spaces. If you look at the um, the WeWork world, it took a it took a beating because they were buying larger commercial office assets, chopping those up, and thinking they were going to be okay. Um, so we we've identified an absolute um, opportunity there to to bring the WeWork back to the facility. So you know because people still want to be in that home environment, but now you can give them nice spaces to work from. If you know if they if the kids are homeschooling, and I know you've been going through it with Heather as, as I, with Mary Beth, um, you know to be able to get out of the house is is also an incredibly pleasant thing, right? <laughs> to be yeah. able to, to, to I'm, I'm more productive out of the home than I am in the home, right? So um, yeah, good stuff. So um, let's do this, John. Uh, I think it's a good opportunity because we started getting into formulas and diving a little deeper. Um, John and I have spent uh, a lot of time with each other recently. Um, we're, we're very proud to bring to the market some, some a deliverable, or an ebook, whatever you know, a book that, that we took some of your old work and um, you know bought, bought it forward a little bit and, and co-authored a book together. Uh, name of the book is Unlocking the Code to Multifamily Investing. Um, at the end of this this call, there'll be a, a link uh, for a free download on that. It touches on a lot of the the topics and the conversation that uh, we're going through right now. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's a gift, right? Always, uh, always give gifts. We're givers. So let's do it this way. Watch, John. Hey, my $100,000, right? I know a guy. He does, uh, they're called syndicated deals, where he raises money. Um, uh, I think it's a Reg C. I don't know, a Reg F. I don't know what they It's a Reg something. But I know this guy, and he's, he's done quite a few of these deals. He's a, he's a good guy, and, you know, he's got a good team. Um, and then you guys over there at Freedom Venture Investments, you, you run a fund. You don't put the money – what's the difference and what's the advantages and disadvantages of, of syndicating, putting all the money on one property, as opposed to getting a preferred rate of return plus targeted returns over the life of the fund? What's the advantage of a fund, John? And, and, and why would I want to entertain something like that, brother? Well, I think it comes down to one word, and that word is uh, diversify. And I think when you have a, a, a situation where some people are looking to get involved in real estate investing, there's a lot of choices that you can have. Um, the thing that makes syndication uh, a good, viable avenue for some people is that it gives them the opportunity to invest in a larger project if they don't necessarily have the financial resources to buy that themselves. So it's a way to participate in the game. Um, the negative, and I think people have found this out uh, or over the last few months or several months. Yeah, they have. <laughs> the old events going on, is that sometimes when you put all of your eggs in one basket um, and the basket is destroyed, uh, or severely hurt, uh, then you, you don't have the returns or the distributions that you're looking for with that uh, scenario. So if you bring in the comparison between that and a fund, uh, the fund has the ability to diversify the involved in one asset in one location and one asset class, like a-, a hey, hey, John, a, time out. That was yeah. really good, dude. And I, I lost a little bit of your signal right there. I think it's on my end, but go back in again and talk about why you, you, you what your thoughts are around a, a, you know, a fun comparison to maybe being invested purely in retail right now, which could be, which could be a pretty painful experience for an investor. Hit that again, man. Okay. so. Uh, you know, when you take a, uh, an asset class like retail, for instance, and we've had the, the events that have unfolded for COVID-19, for instance, right. we have all these social distancing and the economy shutting down. You know, again, people always need a place to live. They don't necessarily need a place to work. And we've, we've proven that during these times. And so if you were in a syndication that just was a retail center, or a matter of fact, a fund that just... Uh, did retail projects and you're going to be in trouble based on the events that have happened or maybe you know uh, severely challenged maybe 
maybe all together, maybe just a little bit, but you're going to have some challenges there. Um, I think with uh, uh, this particular direction, it's about diversifying and going towards the thing uh, that is going to play into that uh, supply and demand model. Uh, right now, the supply is overwhelming the demand for retail. I think you're starting to also see that on the office front as well. But when you look at housing and residential housing by way of multifamily units, it's the exact reverse. I don't see anything on the horizon that would be stopping that or slowing that within reason that um, it is going to be a major change. So I, I think that that would be a benefit to look uh, at um, you know, a fund that participates in that. Plus you get the diversification of many projects as opposed to being invested in just one with a syndication. Yeah, I think you hit it, John. You, we don't have to go to an office and let's just be frank, we don't have to go to the mall. Now I know, you know, I, I was following the numbers and you know, it was a huge uptick in, in retail sales um, in the past, I think it was in the past week. And I get that. I, I do, I get it. But the challenge is this, is that a lot of the, these acquisitions pre-COVID, and you know, let, let's talk about it if, if, if I'm off point, but my, my, my view, my education, my paying attention to what's going on around me, you know, the basics, you know, a lot of these acquisitions pre-COVID were, were tight. Um, you know, if there's ever a, a, a time um, that people were exposed due to, um, you know, speculative type investing, it was pre-COVID. Um, you know, guys like you and I have had conversations online, offline. Um, some of our other board members have had these conversations as well, is the fact that, you know, the fundamentals seem to have taken a walk, like they, they, they took off somewhere, like, you know, the things that were getting taken down at the prices and the cap rates they were being purchased at just didn't seem to make sense to us. And, um, you know, working on fundamentals, knowing that you can push, right, NOI, you can force appreciation through, through two things, preserving capital, number one, and then, and then velocity of capital, like you said, number two. We take those two and we, we line them up side by side. Um, you know, number one, never lose the money. Number two, go back to number one. It goes on and on, right? But fundamentals take over in the, these times of chaos and crisis. Um, what do you see um, cap rates doing uh, post-COVID? Do you see, because we talk about the buying opportunities that, that, that are coming. For me personally, I, I, you know, our fund is focusing on 60 to 150 units. A lot of the, the competitors out there, the big boys, as, as we call them, you know, they focus on 250 unit apartment complexes and bigger. Um, yeah. I've had a couple of conversations this week and I'm like, just give me the stuff that you don't want. I'll take the crumbs because I can absolutely work the numbers a lot faster on a 60 to a 120 unit than I can trying to drive the Titanic. You know what I mean? It's almost like, uh, you know, a four unit is a little, little speedboat blip thing where I like the, the consistency of, of that 61, 150 unit apartment complex. And we focus primarily, as you know, Johnny, on the Gulf Coast region down in Florida with Walter's connection. So what do you, what do you see happening with buying opportunities and how do you see that um, relating over to capitalization rates and, and projected returns? Well, uh, not all the smoke has cleared yet from the whole COVID-19 uh, scenario. But what I do know is this, uh, you know, 10 years ago, online purchases represented somewhere between 5% to 8% of all the purchases that were made from a retail standpoint. That then moved to uh, 13 to 15% um, over the last few years. So there was a lot of upside. If you talk to people on the retail side, that's kind of their uh, hey, bricks and mortar are still needed kind of thing. What's interesting with world events and events like COVID is it just pushed the real estate market from a commercial sense forward ahead of time. It like moved it into the future where I think something like 40% of all purchases made during that time period was made online. It actually gave the consumer confidence that they could make those purchases 
and they could work not in their office building downtown, but at the comfort of their own home. Those two things, purchases and work, happen now at home. And so if, if we said, well, moving forward, if, home, if, if residences are going to be the best option to invest in, as opposed to a place to work, as opposed to a place to buy things, and I always tell the story, if you like grapes, right? You don't go to the grocery store and buy a grape. You buy bunches of grapes. That's why buying multifamily units makes sense. You're buying a bunch of grapes. You're not buying one grape. Hold on. I don't, I don't understand the grape analogy. Can you use one donut over a dozen instead, please, so I can, I can identify with what you're saying, John? I do. You're making Heather laugh over here. I do have... I miss you, Heather. <laughs> I do have a, a, more of a donut body than a grape body, for sure. But think about it. Like, if you, if you, what I just said, if you believe that, which if you look at the stats, it's apparent where this thing is right. going. Um, you're going to want to be a part of, not maybe by yourself, but you're going to be a want to be a part of a system in which that system is buying bunches of grapes or dozens of donuts. Donuts, it, yeah. Because, <laughs> um, yeah, you're a part of many. The, the, and I know for a fact that that trend is going to continue. It was a social experiment, what has happened over the last several months. The social experiment, the results of that told us that if you invest in housing, that's where people are going to buy their things. That's where people are going to go to work. Uh, it's a change. I was listening to um, the CEO, Dave, of Morgan Stanley, and uh, he was talking about, you know, in January, if you would have told us that 90%, this is an employer that don't, employs, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. If they told us that 90% of our workforce was going to work from home uh, by the end of March, I would have said, there's no way that's impossible. And his basic uh, outcome of that was, you know what, not only did that happen, but we were more efficient as a company. So I'm asking myself, as a CEO of Morgan Stanley, why do we need all this bricks and mortar? The trend is there. The science experiment, the social experiment, if you, if you will, clearly shows us that housing is going to be the superstar in uh, real estate investing. And for the average investor out there, you know, the hunger to get involved in some way, some manner, is also been strengthened by that as well. Love it, love it. Um, look, man. I mean, we we covered we covered a ton of ground in a short period of time. I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up a little bit, right? I don't want to go on too long because we we'll just keep going. Uh, your hair will grow and mine will fall out by the time we well maybe your beard will grow in a little more. But um, you know, we were talking before we jumped on the call, and I think you made the comment was you know the buying opportunities are going to be, you know, Q4, Q1 2021, right? Um, and we're, we're aligned for that, which is why the fund came to, to its fruition. Uh, the private placement memorandum um, is, is tight. Um, projected returns, preferred returns, targeted returns to our investors. Um, we're very bullish like you, right? On what, uh, what's going to happen in the multifamily arena and looking for an opportunity to, to expand and grow. Um, there will be this, it's, look, I, I never want to be corny, Johnny. I don't, I don't want to be corny. But, you know, when everybody is greedy, be fearful. And when everybody is fearful, be greedy. And, um, you know, people have asked me personally, you know, what have you been doing? Where are you? You've gone all quiet. Did you quit? Did you retire? You know, did you move to Bora Bora or whatever? And, and it's, it's never a case of, of that. It's a case of um, really taking a, an honest look at the lay of the land and then strategizing the best way possible. And um, that's, that's exactly what the fund is here for. That's why this team has been put together. Um, again, look, can, can, can an individual investor go buy a six-unit property and do it all on their own? Of course they can as long as they're ready for, you know, Bobby in the toilet at three o'clock in the morning and repairs and maintenance. And, and some people love that and that's fine. But then the educated investor who's already got their own daily routine going says, how can I put my capital to work with velocity? And that's, that's why they align themselves with, with guys like us. 
Um, it is a very exciting time. I know it's been an incredibly painful time financially and also, uh, you know, um, socially. I mean, let's just be direct with it, right? We've we, some crazy times going on right now. So let, it's all getting shaken up. And what falls out afterwards, well, that's, that's for everybody to determine which side of the equation they're going to be on, you know, six months, eight months from now going forward. So, um, look, man, I've, I really, really enjoyed um, writing the book with you. I, I, I think I can even share a little uh, looky looky at the, uh, at the new cover. Um, so there it is. I don't know if you can see it, John. That's, you'll maybe see it on the recording, I think. Um, <laughs> unlocking the code to multifamily investing uh, with John Dessauer, Dave Seymour. There's a link um, on the site. Um, you'll be able to get a free download for that. Uh, and then we'll, we'll reach out. Uh, we'll touch gloves with you. Uh, we'll take a look at where you are as an investor, where you want to go, and whether there's a nice fit between your, uh, your investing strategies and ours and uh, a chance to hopefully get together as a team sooner rather than later, um, get out to Chicago, come hang with you and come up to Boston. Then we'll go to our offices down in Florida. We'll look at some more sticks and bricks, baby, and take it all down. Does that sound I like a plan? It. I love awesome. it. Awesome. All right. John, thanks for your time, man. I appreciate it. Heather, if you can hear me, miss you. And uh, we'll all talk real soon. Take care, man. Thanks for your time, Johnny. Thank you. See you, buddy.